Now, I'm, I'm going to do something uh, now that uh, one should uh, take for granted if one's talking at IFPRI, and particularly if you've been here. Uh, I'm going to talk about the centrality of agriculture uh, to food security and, uh, uh, and poverty reduction. And uh, I, I think, I, I presume most everybody here is, is converted on this point, I hope so at least. But uh, I, I want to do a little chastising, including chastising of IFPRI along the way uh, here. I don't do that. The latter I don't do very often. Uh, uh, I want to make a series of points, uh, most of which you recognize. Number one, we're talking about low-income countries. They're rural. <laughs> middle-income countries are a different uh, cup of tea. Uh, that if, if you, in middle-income countries, if you want to focus on growth, uh, you could afford to neglect the agricultural sector. Uh, agriculture is less than 20% of GDP, in many cases down to less than 15%. Uh, if you neglect the agricultural sector, it's pretty easy to make up uh, for the loss of growth there with a little additional acceleration in the other parts of the economy. The employment is different, of course, uh, that uh, you're going to get in a middle-income country, you're still going to get about 80% of your employment growth generated from the agricultural growth and the multipliers from agricultural growth. But there's a split there. There's a difference in whether you're emphasizing uh, GDP growth or whether you're emphasizing employment uh, growth. It's a structural issue, uh, uh, in essence. In the low-income countries, uh, agriculture makes a big difference to the GDP growth as, uh, as well. Now, I, I want to make two sets of comments about data. Number one, we have a whole set, large numbers, of cross-section studies that cut across time and countries relating agricultural growth, manufacturing growth, various kinds of growth, in other words, the structure of the economy, uh, to decline in poverty. Uh, Martin Ravanian and his colleagues have done a lot of these at the World Bank. Uh, Peter Timmer and his colleagues, when he was at Harvard, did a lot of these. Uh, Diffid, uh, Thirtle, and so on, and Diffid, and so on. There are lots of these going around. They all show the same thing. Uh, a strong statistical relationship between growth in the agricultural sector and decline in poverty, and very little statistical relationship between growth in the manufacturing sector and decline in poverty. Now, these are all statistical studies. They're just showing you associations. None of them uh, deal with the causal factors uh, involved in this. Uh, if you go back to some of the earlier work by Monte Galawalia uh, and other people, uh, uh, Dandakar and so on in India, uh, you find they were finding the same relationships over time, that when the weather was good, poverty declined. Uh, when the weather was bad, poverty increased. And what was happening in other sectors didn't have much impact. Now, a uh, number of people associated with IFPRI, uh, most prominently uh, uh, Peter Hazel, uh, his time here as well as time at the World Bank, uh, did studies which showed why uh, the relationships in these cross-section studies show up. And what they effectively showed is that when you raised incomes of farmers, you found them spending a high proportion of their incremental income in the rural non-farm sector, and that's where the poor people were. Now, so, so you ended up from, from their studies with an explanation of the cross-section studies, and of course you ended up with an understanding of relationships in their own right uh, from, these, uh, uh, from these studies. Uh, you, you get people saying now, well, you know, Peter Hazel's work was mostly in Malaysia. It was a very long time ago. And uh, in those days, they used to spend a lot of their incremental money on, uh, uh, on uh, rural non-farm sector. But now they spend it all on stuff imported from China. Uh, well, if you, if you make a simple division of the expenditure data, of the Hazel data, et cetera, you find out that about a quarter of incremental income of farmers, farmers are not poor, by the way, uh, about a quarter of the incremental income of farmers is spent on, in, on food intake, not, not basic cereals, but their livestock and, and horticulture and so on. And about half is spent on the rural non-farm sector, which is very heavily services, and it's very hard to import the services from China. And that still leaves a quarter uh, for a TV set or a radio or uh, uh, 
some manufactured cloth from uh, China. So uh, nobody's saying that the Chinese aren't selling stuff in rural areas. We're just saying that uh, it probably is more than a quarter of the expenditure, and I think that that holds up at the present time. Now, I'm, I'm concerned as to why this isn't played up more. Uh, if you look at the WDR, uh, it, it's very wonderful that the, wor that the World Bank finally, after 26 years or something or other, uh, suddenly discovered agriculture uh, uh, once again. But they, they deal with this issue of the multipliers in the rural non-farm sector uh, to the, uh, to, uh, I'm sorry, of agriculture to the rural non-farm sector. Uh, but then they say, oh, there are other things that are driving it. Uh, there are remittances, uh, there's tourism, uh, and some of these places are near urban areas and so on. So the whole thing in the w, uh, w, WDR uh, gets sort of washed out, and you don't ever get the impression uh, that the vital issue for reducing poverty is to raise the incomes of non-poor people in rural areas, the farmers, and have them expend their money uh, to make employment in the rural non-farm sector. And I, I find the same thing, uh, and there's, there's a, a, a extremely good book dealing with this whole range of issues by uh, Hogblade, uh, Peter Hazel, and I, I, I think Tom Reardon, somebody else is in there. There are three or four uh, co-authors. And you get the same thing, it's sort of waffling on this issue. They, they've got the stuff in there, but then they say there are other things that may be important. Well, if they think the other thing's important, why aren't they measuring those? And we'll see. Uh, in Egypt, uh, the remittances in rural areas are about 6% as important as agriculture as a source of, of, uh, of income. Uh, so it's not a, an important factor, and remittances are thought to be quite important in, uh, in Egypt. We find the same thing in Guatemala. Uh, tourism, forget it. You can't do a study that shows any impact of tourism. Uh, uh, it's, it's so small. Uh, so it would be very hard to pursue that one. Uh, if you want to look at it in a, in a somewhat, uh, 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 let's say, scholar, less scholarly way, go to Luxor uh, in Egypt, and you find that you're in the one of the two or three lowest income provinces in Egypt. Uh, and here's Luxor right in the middle of it, a huge tourist center. And none of that's leaking out to reduce poverty, or essentially none of it in the area. So that, uh, and then finally, uh, Ted Schultz a long time ago drew attention to how urban areas stimulate growth in the rural sector by providing a demand for the agricultural commodities and so forth, and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and also a demand for the rural non-farm sector. But how much of a rural area in a low-income country is urban influenced at this stage? Again, it's going to be, what, 10 percent, 15 percent maximum. So that uh, I, I really fault strongly uh, IFPRI and the World Bank uh, for not coming down hard as to what the dominating driving force is in this uh, poverty reduction in low-income uh, countries. Now, I, I just want to say a couple of quick things on how you accelerate agricultural growth, and I'm going to come back to the main theme uh, that, that's supposed to be driving this. I, I just want to make a simple point on agricultural growth. It's all private it's sector. The farmers are private sector. All those businessmen out there that are doing marketing and selling fertilizer and so on are private sector. This is private sector at its ultimate. It's mostly small-scale private sector. Not only are farmers small-scale, but all these marketing agencies, the fertilizer distributors, they're all small-scale. Small they need public goods to support what they're doing so that the critical things that have to be done in the agricultural sector are public goods provision. We know what they are. Science is what drives agricultural growth. So you need to build science, which means research institutions. You need to build extension programs. You need to do it on a national scale. And this means that the public sector has to play an important role. And when people say to me in Afghanistan, oh, it's old fashioned to do extension in the, in the, uh, uh, in the public sector. They don't do, we don't do it in the United States anymore. Well, I heard that and I called up my, 
a friend of mine who uh, at that time was director of extension in uh, Iowa, and I said, hey, I hear you guys have gone out of business. Uh, well, it turns out it's not quite true. We still have an extension program in this country, and farmers rather like it, even though an awful lot of extension is in the private sector at the present time, but not in Afghanistan, for goodness sakes. Uh, infrastructure. Uh, I, I think one can talk about a, uh, a toll, private sector toll highway from uh, Delhi to Mumbai, uh, Mumbai uh, or to Madras or, or Chennai or what have you, but not rural roads. Uh, so again, you have a big pu public sector requirement. Huge need for farmers' organizations if you're going to have agriculture growing rapidly. Far more necessary now than it was 20 years ago because now the perishables, the livestock and the horticulture are a much larger share of ag GDP than they used to be. And the traditional marketing uh, systems aren't working very well there uh, for a variety of reasons. So that farmers' organizations are important. As long as you're doing aid as little discrete projects, you can then talk about your aid contractor setting up a credit system there that somehow looks like a private sector system, but not when you're talking about covering 80% of the farmer, never mind 100%, but talking about covering 80% of the farmers in a country, the government has to play a role in that, as it did in the United States. Uh, the whole farm credit system in this country uh, was started by the government with government money and government bureaucrats. Very important principle. Right from the beginning, it was to become farmer-owned, which means that farmers would displace the government capital, and farmer-managed, which means the farmers would elect the boards and so on. And that got done fairly quickly in this country, and it doesn't get done very quickly in most developing countries. And finally, uh, there's a need for policy, and policy is a lot more than wheat price policy. Uh, policy is a very complex uh, matter, and uh, you need uh, an IFPRI in, in essentially every one of these uh, uh, countries, and that's going to be sort of public sector. Uh, uh, there's some people think IFPRI is a private sector institution because the, uh, uh, all the money doesn't come from governments, but uh, I think a lot of it still comes from, uh, uh, from governments. So you, you, uh, you, you have to do a lot of public sector institutions. Finally, you have to train large numbers of people at a very high level because of the technical nature of developing uh, agriculture. And my final point, you have to change the ideology of the macroeconomists if we're going to do these things. Now, before I, I get back to the main story, I want to say four things about the major improvement in the macro environment within which poverty reduction is to take place in developing countries. I made the point that poverty reduction is very much driven by getting the agriculture sector going and getting those multipliers to the rural non-farm sector. So the fact that we're not doing well in low-income countries uh, is despite the fact that the conditions within which we operate in the macro environment are more favorable than they used to be. And I, I want to note four things. Number one, we seem to have a significant, probably permanent, not, not permanent where it was six months ago, but probably permanent improvement in the terms of trade uh, for major agricultural uh, uh, commodities. Keep in mind that a high proportion of the low-income countries are in sub-Saharan Africa. I, I remember a number of years ago, uh, somebody asked me, uh, uh, you know, you're so negative about Africa. Aren't there any success stories? And I said, yeah. There's a huge success story. What? Malaysia. Malaysia is a great success story, and it's basically an African country. Uh, the upland soils are all like the up rolling upland soils of West Africa. Uh, the river valleys, I, I do know that Malaysia is in, somewhere off in Asia, but uh, uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the, and Malaysia has the same river valleys with these very rich alluvial soils that you have in West Africa. And what do they do in Malaysia? They grow rice in the river valleys and do it pretty well now. And on the very poor upland soils, they're growing tree crops, uh, mostly for export. And of course, they ran away with the, with the African oil palm industry. Uh, they, uh, they, they sent, uh, a long time ago, uh, they sent to what was then the Belgian Congo uh, a whole team of people from Malaysia 
to go to what was the premier oil palm research station in the world, ENIAC, in, uh, in the old Belgian Congo. And uh, they learned a lot about what had to be done in research, went back and set up their institution. And by the way, they stole a few uh, oil palm varieties from ENIAC and took them back, and that gave them a, a leg up on the, uh, on the process. So that uh, the, 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 the terms of trade moving towards tropical export commodities, oil palm in particular, but several others as well, the improvement in terms of trade for horticultural commodities because of this huge increase in, in incomes in, in the world uh, has been, is very favorable for developing countries. Secondly, this is not the, not the, uh, the, the, the half year in which to make this next statement, but uh, I, I assume that we'll be back sometime in the next uh, year or two to capital being abundant as it was up until six months ago. So that you could think about outfits like McCary uh, making investments in trunk highways and in electric power in low income countries if they got their policies right. Uh, and taking that financing burden off of the local capital sources and off of the government so that there's much more available then uh, to go into the rural sector. So that this change in the capital availability in the world, and as I say, we're, we're having a little bit of a glitch right now, but I hopefully we'll get over that. Uh, there is a change in the capital availability in the world, and that's very helpful to low-income countries. The third thing that's, that's happened is that We've had huge breakthrough in basic science. And what agricultural growth is all about is very efficiently coming up with applications of science to agriculture, uh, which are arrived at very efficiently if there's good basic science. And we've gone a huge distance uh, in applied science in agriculture based on a single sort of basic science concept from 160 years ago, Mendelian genetics, was a huge breakthrough, uh, which made, uh, you, you know, farmers have always done research. They've always tried things out and uh, planted, you know, selected from their plots and so on. But it was a very slow process because they didn't uh, have Mendelian genetics behind them. Uh, when you got on an experiment station, got that basic science behind you, you could do it so much more efficiently uh, than the farmers uh, uh, were doing their research and so on. And of course, we got, uh, what is it, 16 odd years ago, maybe it's a little longer than that now, uh, we got this big breakthrough on, on uh, recombinant DNA. And uh, we were, it came along just about when we were running out of what we could do uh, with, with Mendelian genetics. I think in Africa, we can still go a ways on Mendelian genetics, but uh, more generally, uh, we're gonna have to uh, start using the new science. And uh, uh, I, I always get this, this comment when I raise this, oh, but you know, isn't that a bad thing? Well, uh, I just wanna remind you that I've never heard of anybody in the world uh, that was opposed to scientific use of the breakthrough of recombinant DNA. Certainly the Europeans are absolutely four square uh, from moving full speed ahead uh, in this area, but for health, not for agriculture. And uh, that's because the big problem on health in Europe uh, is cancer and things like that, and so you want to use the most recent science for it. Uh, the big problem in very poor countries is not cancer, but malnutrition. And so you want to use the latest in science for agriculture. So they both want to, both the Europeans and the uh, we, we make money out of it, so we're on the developing country side, but uh, bo both the Europeans and developing countries want to use this pure science breakthrough, but for different things. One is for health and one is for other. So that we've had a huge improvement in scientific knowledge, and that's a big plus uh, for developing countries. And finally, uh, we know a tremendous amount more about development uh, than we knew 20 or 30 years ago, and we know particularly a great deal more about how to develop agriculture. Now, I'm just appalled at the lack of literacy uh, about economic development and literature and so on uh, when I travel to the various aid missions around the world. Uh, and I think this is even somewhat true in the World Bank, that there's much less reading of the literature uh, from uh, people in the World Bank than there was 20, uh, 20 years ago. Uh, that uh, I, I could never go to a, uh, an aid mission 20 or 30 years ago 
uh, without people asking me questions about this uh, journal article or that journal article. And so on. that just doesn't happen now. Well, they're just a, I mean, just look at the stuff that IFRI has turned out over the last 15 years. And uh, I, I think IFRI does an awfully good job of getting this stuff out, and much better than when I was here. And, uh, but uh, the, the extent to which it's having an impact on mission after mission uh, is pretty low. Uh, but the, the basic point I wanted to make 